Broadcasting from Baltimore, Maryland, and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here is your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, a value investing service published by Stansberry Research. We have a really cool show and let's just get on with it. Let's start with the rant. Okay, now last week's rant relates to this week. In fact, this week is kind of a continuation of last week. Um, it may even be a little shorter just because this is something I, I would have liked to have done last week. Now, last week you will recall that I told you a little story about the fish in the water, and, and, the, and the idea was that fish are unaware of water. The thing that sustains them, like the most important fact of their existence, their whole world is water. And yet, uh, they're perhaps unaware of its existence until you pull them out of it, right? And I said that water for investors meant, you know, anything that's super duper important that you take so for granted that you are mostly unaware of its existence. And the ultimate example, with no stupid pun intended, was liquidity. Right, liquidity is the thing you take for granted. You take it for granted that you go into the market and you can sell at the market, and and you can sell you know a hundred thousand shares of just about anything in the U.S. stock market, and you won't move the price. The market barely knows you're there. It's a very deep, very liquid market, and there are other markets like that too. And futures and currencies are probably the the deepest market in the world. Just trades like trillions and trillions a day. So. That was that was the point of last week. It was just things that, you know, you may want to think about that you're taking for granted that if they're not there, uh, you're it's going to hurt you as an investor. And one of the things we talked about was bond yields and the relationship of stocks and bonds. OK, and we at this point uh, in our history in the market, we. We kind of take it for granted, I feel a lot of people do, that bonds are an adequate diversifier for stocks. In other words, you know, when your stocks are going down, your bonds are going up. And you just kind of count on that, right? People leave stocks and they retreat to the perceived safety of bonds. Well, historically speaking, that is a fairly recent phenomenon, as we discussed. It's probably just in the last. I know it's just in the last 20 years. And for example, there's um, there's a lot of stuff on the internet about this. You can And a lot of really good work that you can get to. One piece is by a company called Graham Capital Management. It's from September 2017. And it goes by the just riveting, exciting, sexy name of Equity Bond Correlation, A Historical Perspective. Wow. Uh, but it's good work. And it shows some charts of stocks and bonds and correlations together um, over a very long period of time. They looked at like 140 years of data. And, and the point is, is similar to the one I made. And they, they conclude rather nicely here. I'll just read a bit of this. Equity bond correlation is not a static number. It can be both positive and negative. The observed correlation is the result of rich and dynamic interaction between a multitude of macroeconomic factors. There's no economic theory or empirical model that fully captures this dynamism. And they go on to say that they use 140 years of data. And the most recent period uh, of negative correlation, they say, began in the 90s, like the, the late 90s, probably. Uh, prior to that, equity bond correlation was positive over 40 years for over 40 years, right? So, so before the 90s, you didn't make this assumption that we make that, you know, when my, when my stocks are doing poorly, my bonds will save me, right? And, and, and for quite a bit of history, you, you couldn't make that assumption. And the point this week that I'm trying to make here is about diversification, 
Okay, are you truly diversified? Because if all you own is stocks and bonds, you know, in in terms of recent history, well, you could say, yeah, I mean, I'm you know, I'm diversified. When my stocks go down, my bonds go up and save me, and I'm and I'm good. But maybe that won't. Maybe that's a more dynamic thing than you think it is, and and maybe you shouldn't take for granted. Um, and maybe you shouldn't assume that if that's all you're holding, that you're diversified. So this week, what what does it mean to be diversified? Should you even be diversified? Are you holding a diversified portfolio or not? How how do you think about that? And obviously, the first the first point we've already made. Um, if all you own is bonds and stocks, maybe you're not as diversified as you think, at the very least. And you know, there's there's some stuff recently to suggest this is especially worth thinking about now. There was an article recently in the Wall Street Journal, and um, the title is very long, but it's stocks, bonds, oil, Bitcoin are all up. The everything rally is back, worrying some investors. Nearly 90% of 70 financial asset classes posted positive total returns this year through April. And the reason why this correlation thing is important, like we found out in 2008 that, you know, you thought you were diversified, but like everything went down because anything that's liquid enough will be sold. If, if you have assets that are losing value, like real estate assets were losing value then, homes especially, um, and commercial real estate too. You, you, well, you know, you can't just uh, click a button in your Ameritrade account and sell your house, right? So, so people sold stocks and bonds and anything they could sell um, during times, you know, during during that horrible time, and that's that's sort of that can be a real test of uh, how diversified you really are. If you're holding a bunch of financial assets you should really question your level of diversification. Like, you know, if it's all stocks, bonds, REITs, ETFs, MLPs, you know, anything that trades on the stock exchange and has a fairly deep and liquid market, maybe you're not as diversified as you think, okay? And I think if you do want to hold lots of stocks and bonds, maybe one way to get truly diversified is through geography. Right. If you're, for example, one could imagine if you hold lots of stocks and you're you could imagine that your your U.S. stocks might be doing really poorly at a time when when China or India or some other country is doing really well. So that could be a good way to be diversified, geographically speaking. And I know um, there's a guy named Meb Faber who does a lot of really good good research and has a pretty good Twitter feed too. And, you know, he's, he's a kind of a friend of Stansberry. He's, he's, he's around a lot and, um, and he does really good work. And one of his constant things that he's saying is that, you know, people are just so overweight, the United States and their portfolios, they're not truly geographically diversified. My personal take on, on diversification is that it, that there are two factors the two factors that i think lead to to true diversification are actually valuation and timing so if you think theoretically say you start out 100% in cash at any given moment say i'm 100% in cash right now and i've come onto the scene and i'm like i want to be an investor what should i look at right now i would say at least be underweight U.S. stocks because we're bumping up against the all-time highest valuations ever. Be careful what you own there. Um, but obviously, in the newsletter I write, Extreme Value, we're going to recommend a new stock this week. There are long ideas out there. You just have to be careful. So maybe you think that, and then maybe you look around and you say, well, geez, gold is at a cyclical looks like a cyclically low moment and gold stocks are are um you know the companies themselves are becoming more efficient and uh it's becoming a little bit more of a real business um uh, 
you know, compared to what it was in the past. And, and, you know, there's good value there and cyclically and in terms of the valuation, it's kind of the right moment. And some of the best business models, the, the royalty companies and, and other things um, and prospect generators are dirt cheap um, and can be had for good prices. So maybe I'll put a little allocation there. And at other times you might, and, and there could be anything like you could, you could be reading the newspaper or, or just looking around and, and notice that, you know, an apartment building in your town is trading for a really cheap price or, you know, offered on the market at a price that seems reasonable. And you go look into it and, you know, you find out that indeed it's, you know, consistently um, occupied and, you know, maybe there's a few little things wrong with it and you could fix them for not too much money and it's a good deal. And so you allocate a little bit to that. You know, that would be, um, I think Porter Stansberry has talked about this. It's like diversifying, uh, you, you allocate to value, right? At any given time, you're looking at the things that provide the most value. And, and no matter what you buy, um, you know, the price determines the return, right? If you pay twice as much as everybody else that, you know, you're going to make half as much, right? So, so at any given time, there's something around that's attractive and, and that's what it, that's what you want to own. And I'm not saying this stuff is easy to find. None of this is easy. Anybody who says, like Charlie Munger says, you know, anybody who says it's easy is a moron. <laughs> okay. So I said valuation and timing, and they kind of go together. All, all I'm saying is that, um, you know, be aware of cycles and be aware that there are moments when, you know, if, if we get another 2000, March 2009 moment, uh, maybe you want to get really overweight U.S. stocks uh, and really overweight high yield debt. You know, you want to be you want to be less diversified at that moment. But, and so I, when I say timing, I tend to think of diversification as happening across time. Not, it's not a static recipe that you follow. And, you know, these people on Wall Street put out these numbers where they'll say, you know, you should be in 60% stocks and 40% bonds. And then they'll come out, you know, a week or a month later and say, uh, we're, you know, we're changing this to 55% uh, stocks and 45% bonds. You know, like as if they could actually tweak anything to that degree. It's it's absurd. It's stupid. It's ridiculous. Okay. No one can tell you what those numbers should be. And if you just allocate across time to value and you know good assets when you see them, uh, I, I think you'll wind up over time being quite well diversified. And for me, the ultimate diversifier is cash because that is not going to lose its value when other things lose their value. And of course, you can't stay in cash. You can't be a 90% in cash all the time. You won't make any money. But at any given time, you want to have some cash available so you can take advantage of whatever's happening. And I saw an interesting article. All kinds of things can get cheap. Um, interesting Bloomberg article. Um, was about it, it's about um, the f the simple fact that right now one of the things that's cheap is really volatility or or protection against a big downturn, especially in the stock market. And there is um, there's a guy named Mark Spitznagel who runs this fund uh, that. It's called like Universa Investments. And th that's their thing is tail risk hedging. You know, they can, they help investors um, hedge the big, bad, ugly drawdown risks. Um, and so the point of this article, um, I'll just read a sentence or two here. It says, prepping for Armageddon has rarely been so cheap. Just ask Mark Spitznagel, the Miami-based investor, uh, whose 4.1 billion black swan fund specializes in hedging against cataclysms on the scale of the dot-com crash in the 2008 financial crisis. And there's a couple things you look at. One of them is the VIX. He mentions the VIX, and he says it's funny that the richer the markets get, 
which ultimately leads to crashes, the cheaper the insurance. So it's really crazy because, you know, it's sort of like if the if you were living on a coastline somewhere and the weather was just, you know, if it was known to be very uh, volatile and yet for some reason it was like really sunny and calm for an extended period of time, you know, everybody knows a hurricane's coming at some point. You know, when the weather gets really, really good for an extended period of time, uh, you know, there and in the market, uh, the price of the insurance falls. You know, it should probably go up because because in the market, it like you know, like Spitznagel says, the richer it gets, the more likely uh, you're going to get one of these sort of cataclysmic events. So, you know, right now, one of the things that you want to allocate to, um, and I recently did this myself on Friday, I thought, you know, um, the thing that's cheap right now is basically volatility, like way out of the money put options. And maybe you allocate a very small amount, but the neat thing about that is that, you know, your put options can expire worthless. So maybe you want to go out as far as you can in time uh, without overpaying. The point is to, to pay as little as possible. And so I tend to go way out of the money, um, as far out in time as I can, and still not, not overpay. And that that'll treat you good. I mean, just the last, you know, few days earlier this week, um, I, I actually took my Friday bet off the table because I it was essentially a bet that May would be a terrible month, um, and it just, you know, it just kind of surged <laughs> the first thing on Monday. And I thought, well, you know, among other things, I have a busy month. I don't want to have to pay too much attention to this. I've made well more than, you know, twice what I put in on Friday, just just like that when the market swooned. And, uh, you know, so I'm good. And and the expire on that was really short term. It was like the end of May. So I was thinking, though, in terms of allocation and in terms of value and in terms of how things are at this time. This is really general, so I, you know I hope it's worth something to you because my my main point here is simply that diversification is not a static recipe; it's dynamic and changes over time. A good example of that is the fact that equity bond correlations have changed over time. So that means that the nature of whether or not you're diversified changed over time. So if you took that expectation that you know you that you had in the 70s and 80s about the relationship between bonds and stocks. And if you just carried it into the 90s and 2000s, you'd be wrong. You could lose money doing something like that if you don't acknowledge the changing nature of diversification, the dynamic nature of it. And that really is my message here. Okay, I, I'm going to leave it right there. Um, and, and you know, just look around and think about that. And, uh, you know, maybe write in, you know, if I've been kind of too vague and too general and not specific enough, maybe you could write in and ask me a question and we'll, we'll get to it in the, uh, in the reader feedback, but that's the rant. And uh, let's talk about what's new right now. Okay. What's new in the world this week? Um, IPOs are what's new. Uh, We we talked last week about the beyond meat IPO, right? The, uh, meat alternative, the plant-based meat company. And I still recommend reading the letter from the founder, Ethan Brown of of Beyond Meat. It's a very good letter. And so this week, it looks like Uber is going to go public on Friday. Uber, the the ride-hailing service. Uh, I, I use Uber all the time. I used to park at the airport. Now I don't bother. I just Uber to the airport. Uh, and it's, and it's cheaper than parking there. And obviously a lot more convenient because I don't have to worry about my car. I can just get right in, right out of the car and right into the terminal. Um, and I know people who live in places like my old hometown of Baltimore who actually don't, if they own a car, I've never seen them use it. They Uber everywhere all around town when they're in the city. So, um, you know, it's it's really a cool thing. And I I can tell you, like having been in situations where I had to wait for a cab, you know, Uber's really cool. Okay. As a service, it's really cool. Um, as, 
as an investment, you know, I, I don't, mm, it's tough. Um, let's talk actually about, you know, I said, you've got to read that beyond meat letter, the letter to shareholders, because it was so good. Um, and I just want to contrast that with the letter from, um, his name is Dara, I'm sorry, Kuzrel Shahi. I hope I didn't butcher that too badly. He's the CEO of Uber. And his letters, it's just full of like lots of fluffy sounding stuff. I mean, there's a few little, a few little, you know, numbers and things. Today, Uber accounts for less than 1% of all miles driven globally. And I've heard also that the the global automobile fleet is this trillion or multi-trillion dollar asset that sits idle like 90 plus percent of the time, right? You drive somewhere, it sits. Your car mostly just sits. So it's this underutilized asset, which is an interesting thought. Um, so maybe there could be fewer cars on the road, right? Um, which would be great for everybody. But otherwise, this letter is like really just the, the it, it's kind of a more typical fluffy thing. You know, we will optimize for the happiness and loyalty of our customers. We will not shy away from making short-term financial sacrifices when we see clear long-term benefits. That's nice. That's really nice if you can do that. But I, I'd rather he were more specific. There was something really specific and educational about that letter from Beyond Meat that I just don't find here. And it's just sounding too much like a typical corporate sort of a thing. So there's that. Then, okay, so let's talk numbers. It looks like they're going to assign a valuation according to what I've read in the press. Looks like we're going to get a share price between $44 a share and $50 a share, which puts the total market cap around uh, between maybe 70 and 80 billion. So just call it like 75. Well, actually call it 80 billion. Um, and they did 11.7 billion in sales last year. So, you know, pushing towards seven times sales, which ain't cheap for a company that just loses and loses and loses money. The funny thing about this is that the losses seem to grow um, they, they've grown with sales, generally speaking. You know, normally you, if you have really good um, scale, if your business is scalable, sure, you'll lose a lot of money in the beginning when you're making very few sales because you're, you know, you just have a certain amount of fixed cost and you got to meet that and exceed it to start making a profit. But these guys, you know, they lost three billion in 2016, four billion in 2017. Actually, they lost three billion in 2018. So maybe that's maybe that'll go in the right direction from now on. But it's still a, a lot of losses, considering that sales were like, um, well, they were like half a half a billion in 2014, but two billion in 2015, and then really in just the roundest numbers, two billion 2015, almost four billion 2016, almost eight billion 2017. So it's like doubling every year, and yet still like the losses rose. Through, throughout that time. Um, so apparently the, the scale of this business needs to be like way, way bigger. But, but the sales, you know, did not double again in 2018, went from about 8 billion to about um, actually 11, I said 11.7, 11.3 billion. So about 11 billion. So, you know, we are, we are um, at, at 80 billion, we're, we're at seven times sales. So it's really rich, you know, it's a typical, IPO of our time. And by the way, the Beyond Meat IPO, that thing, that thing has taken off like a rocket ship. And, and the thing now trades at like 50 times sales and they make losses. They don't make a profit. Uh, and they're not showing any sign of approaching the kind of scale they need to make a, to make a profit. Um, and there's competition. There's another product called, uh, what, impossible meat, I think it is. And there's some stuff in the press that suggests that on taste alone, which is what all anybody's going to care about with this, um, it, it, beats, it beats Beyond Meat out, um, you know, in tasting. So, you know, 50 times sales for the inferior competitor just doesn't sound quite right to me. 
And and when we look at Uber too, uh, you know, Lyft, the competing ride sharing service, that thing's down thirty percent since it went public. So, um, if Uber performs similarly, that's that's just not good. Uh, and and I don't think we have any reason to suspect that it will perform differently. Now, obviously, we had no reason to suspect that Beyond Meat would be up, whatever it is, seventy or eighty percent in a week in its first week when, when it's, you know, clearly, clearly way overvalued and in a hyper competitive market. And I'll tell you a little secret here in the beyond meat IPO, uh, filing, you know, the, the sec filing, it's called S one in their S one filing. They mention you know, a one point, I think it's like a $1.4 trillion meat market globally. And, and the, The classic thing that you'll hear from an entrepreneur is the market is $1 trillion. And if we just get 1% of it, et cetera, et cetera, we'll be great. But the thing, the problem with that is that's not the way it works. And in fact, when you hear that pitch, 1% of a gargantuan market, addressable market, you, you just put your hand on your wallet, back away, and when you're far enough away, turn around and run. Because that is the opposite of a good setup. A really good setup, and I think this was dealt with, I, I, I've read too many books lately, like portions of too many books. I think it was in Zero to One by Peter Thiel. I'm going to take a wild guess there. Where the point was that you want to, you want to hear somebody say, this market is pretty small and we can capture 30 or 50% of it overnight. That's what you want to hear. So when you hear the opposite of that, you should be very skeptical. And that's what uh, that's what Beyond Meat was pitching. Um, so, you know, Uber, uh, maybe it might not do so well. I don't know. Who knows? I'm not predicting anything. But it doesn't look attractive in terms of valuation. Uh, it looks like it has a long way to go before it makes a profit. I'm not saying they never will make one. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, not, it's not sexy, man. It's not sexy. <laughs> I don't like the look of it. Okay, so we talk, already talked about the Beyond Meat IPO. Let's talk about Tesla, because we like to do that so much. The story is just getting more and more interesting. And we did talk last week about um, an equity raise. They launched a combined, they did it, they launched a combined equity and convertible debt offering that'll bring in $2.3 billion. Musk says, Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla, says, um, Tesla's promised that it will have 1 million robo taxis on the road by the end of 2020. Is you know that promise is still still intact. I mean this is this is the middle of 2019. These guys have have you know he's overshot the projections on on production in a rather glaring and some people would say it like fraudulent way. Uh but but they're going to put 1 million robo taxis, right? Robo taxi, you get it where you know you get in and nobody's driving but but the computer. Um that's that's insane. Um there you know it's just an insane projection. This guy um we'll talk more about him in the mailbag today, but he just the the things he says, he just gets it sounds like he's getting more and more desperate and you know raising equity when the price is well off the all-time high. He should have raised when the stock was pushing toward 400, but now it's pushing down <laughs> towards 200 and he's raising. So um, it, it just strikes me that Elon's getting more desperate and, and we'll see how all this plays out. Remember our, our newest, uh, our newest editor at Stansberry research, Whitney Tilson says that Tesla will be under a hundred by the end of the year. I think it's an excellent call. I do agree with him. I think the time has come. People are starting to figure out that this is not going to happen. And, um, and you know, the share price has already reflected some of that. A few little things happening. Um, Disney is selling some assets. You know, they acquired 21st Century Fox for $71 billion. And what happens in mergers every now and then, the uh, the regulatory people get involved and say, you own too much stuff. If you want to buy this gigantic company, you have to sell some stuff so that you won't own too much stuff. And they're being forced to sell off regional networks, uh, 21 regional sports networks, 
for $10.6 billion. They're going to be scooped up by the Sinclair Broadcast Group, which, if I'm not mistaken, that was recommended in uh, the Stansbury Investment Advisory, uh, and they did pretty well with it. They they understood the business quite well. Of course, they're both based in Maryland, Stansbury and Sinclair, and um, they did some research and and made a good pick. And so maybe that'll change the economics of Sinclair, and it's probably worth another look just to see because when you see something in the market like this, this is a forced sale, a forced sale of assets they probably would rather not sell. And that is something that I learned from Seth Klarman, the value guru and one of the most successful investors of the past three decades or so. Um, he looks around the market for forced sales of various kinds, and that's what's happening here. One more little item, Facebook is hit with a $5 billion fine. Uh, and U.S. senators are saying the $5 billion fine is a bargain. You know, it's a bargain for, for Facebook because, of course, they've got billions and billions, so it's easy for them to pay it. And same thing with Google. You know, the European Union has hit Google with these multi-billion dollar fines. These people, I mean, they've just got, they're, they're gushing tens of billions in cash flow. They, they have no problem paying a few billion fine. Uh, and... The, of course, this was when Facebook had improperly shared the data of more than 80 million of its users, right? And Mark Zuckerberg sat in front of Congress and said, we don't do that. And of course, they do do it. We all knew at that moment that he was lying and it cost him 5 billion bucks. Probably should cost him 50 billion. You know, that data is, that's our privacy. You know, you may as well, you may as well walk into the bathroom and throw the shower curtain open while we're in there, Right. All right, let's let's get on to our interview. We have a great one today. Uh, we're going to learn about something I know nothing or very little about. Okay, today's interview is very exciting for me because I know I'm going to learn a lot. Our guest is Eric Wade. He is an editor and analyst with Stansbury Pacific Research. He's an internet entrepreneur and investor who began picking stocks and trading futures contracts in college using his expertise to become a certified financial manager at the largest American retail brokerage. He eventually sold the internet domain of his nickname, wallstreet.com, for over U.S. $1 million. Nice play, Eric. Eric has also been an angel investor, a movie script writer, and the founder of a family business that was recognized locally and internationally. He has also worked with some of the largest companies and ad agencies worldwide to expand their marketing reach. Eric's cryptocurrency career began by mining Bitcoin. Soon he turned to mining Ethereum. Then he even taught himself how to build and program his own miners. That is so cool. As the wave of interest in cryptocurrencies grew in 2016 and 2017, Eric began mining dozens of other cryptos. And as an investor, he's made huge profits in this space. Uh, 30x by buying Verge under a penny, 22x profit on Sia Coin, and a 30x profit on Substratum ICO, a 4x return on Stratus and Civic in 60 days. Please welcome Eric Wade. Eric, welcome to the program. Hello. Thank you. So, Eric, um, I want you to tell us all a bit about your background, specifically when you were growing up in the 70s, you had a device in your house that most of us didn't have, didn't you? I sure did. Um, I was raised in New Mexico and specifically just outside of Los Alamos, New Mexico, where there was national laboratories that my father dealt with computers very early. So he would uh, get access to computers and wanted to make sure that our family knew that was the future and uh, computers would come home with us. We had uh, terminals that we could log into the university and use computers back when uh, the modem was something that was attached to the back of the computer and you would physically push your phone into the soft uh, cups of the modem so that the two computers could talk to each other. So I was, I was raised from an early age just being really comfortable with uh, computers and networking and the possibilities of that. That is very cool. 
So how did you get from, I mean, you've had a really varied career. Um, how did you get from, you know, sort of being raised with computers in the house at a time when nobody else had them, you know, all the way to cryptos? There's a, there seems like there was a lot of stuff in between those two things. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, when I graduated from college, I had been studying economics and I went into uh, finance, stock brokerage, financial management, and always had in the back of my mind a love for privacy and cryptography. And, you know, like I said, being around Los Alamos, New Mexico, where there's a lot of secrets held and the ability to keep secrets is important. Um, that was just something that I was always, always comfortable with. And the longer I spent with economics and the number of uh, huge market changes and rallies that you, you go through, I'm sure you could probably agree with this, is that it helps shape your psyche in some ways when you see uh, a market, well, we just you just talked about some of the exuberance that's coming into the market and your rationality. Um, and you see that and you live through it a few times and you start thinking, I wonder if there's something out there that can somewhat be attractive economically speaking, but also secure and also in, in some respects um, self-guided right? Like a, like a person could be in charge of their own finances. And the world we live in, we're getting, we're getting further and further away from that. We're getting more into a world of convenience, right? Where we have all of our finances uh, running through online and digital and, uh, you know, the same online bank account and uh, less and less, fewer and fewer of us hold less and less actual cash or hard assets we're getting really comfortable with these digital assets. Uh, I was a, a financial manager during the time when we changed over from people actually having physical stock certificates or, or paper bonds, and they were all turned in and, and digitized. And, uh, you know, even those assets where someone had held a certificate in their family for generations, those were turned in and turned into digital assets. And obviously, some measure of security <laughs> to so to speak some measure of, of of you know individuality is lost in that and 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 crypto addresses that for me specifically bitcoin which was obviously created uh to be a peer-to-peer -peer independent type of currency and the, the the idea that that there was something out there that if, if you had the program running on your computer and I had it running on my computer and you and I agreed on the terms of a, of a transaction, we could bank between ourselves without an intermediary. And that's, that's the promise that Bitcoin held to me was, was peer to peer transactions. And I think a lot of Americans, a lot of Europeans. Okay, Eric, I'm going to, Eric, I'm going to interrupt no you. No problem. I'm going to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Let, let's just, let's assume that maybe there's a few listeners like me who have heard the phrase peer-to-peer -peer a million times and sort of kind of think we know what it means, but what does it really mean? That's a great question because that's at the core of the value of Bitcoin and then a lot of the other cryptocurrencies that are out there. What peer-to-peer -peer means is I can literally directly send you something, almost like if, if I was to see you at work and I hand you a piece of paper, then that paper, whatever was written on it, just went from peer to peer, right? Like I didn't, I didn't mail it through a system. I didn't email it. I didn't put it in a FedEx envelope. And uh, I, may, I may be able to send you something using FedEx, but it's not peer to peer. It's, it's me handing something to Federal Express that then they drive across the country and then they hand to you, as opposed to me handing you something directly. And I think we're, we're in a stage now where a lot of us have the luxury of not caring about that because our service providers do a pretty good job. You know, if I need to transfer some money using Bank of America, I don't even really think about the fact that I don't hold the money and I'm not handing it to the end user, right? It's, it's, 
I've got this luxury that every time I log into Bank of America and I send money to wherever I send it, Bank of America is holding the money and they're handing what they call money to the person on the other end. So no, no part of that is peer to peer. But if I ever wanted to be able to conduct peer to peer, almost like, uh, you know, in the olden days, barter or something like that, right? Like you wouldn't, if, if you're trading a, an ox for a mallet, you, you wouldn't mail the ox or the mallet back and forth. You would hand them to each other. And, and you'd verify, yep, this looks like a good ox and that looks like a good mallet. And, and the transaction would take place. But with digital goods, that's harder, especially if you're trying to go around the world. So what, what the Bitcoin idea was, was could I send a digital good from myself, you know, point A, Alice to Bob without somebody else having to be involved? without it going through a middleman who could either stop it or inspect it or control it. And that's another aspect of crypto that's really appealing is, is I don't necessarily want someone else to have the power to stop my transaction. Or in the case of, let's just say, uh, pick on a, a bank that's had problems being um, um, you know, full uptime before is Wells Fargo. There's been times that Wells Fargo wasn't able to conduct transactions. And if your money's in Wells Fargo, you're stuck. So Bitcoin was, was generated from the mind of someone who's trying to solve the problems of a, what, what looked like a financial meltdown about a decade ago and thinking, well, what are some of these problems? Is that we're, we're really dependent upon these institutions to do what we tell them to do with our money. So what, how do you break away from an institution that owns, you know, the, that, that, that is the connection is you create something peer to peer and you, you create something that if, if I want to send you my digital money, nobody can get in the way. And on the other end of it, you can recognize it and say, okay, good. Eric sent me, you know, three bitcoins or five bitcoins or whatever it is, uh, Bitcoin, um, and, and you're assured that they were, that they, that they are something that I actually own. So it's actually, a lot of people feel like the, the notion of cryptocurrencies is, is overly confusing, but I like to think of it as, as almost like common sense. Like if I wanted to build a system that I could send you digital money, the first question I'd expect you to ask would be, well, how do I know it's real? How, how your know, common sense would tell you, how do I know if this is digital money and it's, and there's no one assuring me that it's real, because remember we're peer to peer, you know, if, if I send you money through Wells Fargo or through Bank of America, then Bank of America is assuring you that, that it's real, right? But if I take them out of the mix, then you need some other kind of assurance that it's real and you need some sort of assurance that I actually have that money. And that assurance is? <laughs> well, that's the algorithms and the programs that run on the Bitcoin network. It's, a, it's basically a network of computers that all talk to each other and share information. So if I send you two Bitcoin, the whole network finds out about it within 10 minutes and approves it and says, okay, now Eric no longer has those two Bitcoin and Dan does. And that way you can then spend them or send them on or hold on to them because now the whole network knows that you own them without any one point of the network being in charge of it. The whole network works together. It's like a ledger system where it keeps track of everything and then secures it with, uh, with cryptography, with a, with a very powerful algorithm. And since they're all computers – that are talking to each other, the, the ledger is held on the computers. It's also a pretty savvy system that says, if anyone tries to attack this computer network or hack it, it makes itself more difficult. So that if, if you were to think to yourself, well, now that I know Eric has Bitcoin, I'll try to overwhelm his computer. I'll try to hack that computer and take the rest of his Bitcoin. Well, the, the more you try to attack the network, the more difficult it makes itself. And that was built into it. And that's, that's, those are the components that I feel like make it 
common sense, right? If it, if you were to have a digital network of, of an intangible store of value, let's call it these Bitcoin, then you'd want it to be something that could be verified. And the, the program does that in the ledger that, that, that we all share on the network verifies what you own and what I own. And you'd also want it to be secure, right? If we were to do business with, with digital goods, all of your common sense questions that would come next have been answered with, with Bitcoin. And, and that's what kind of drew, drew me to it because r- realistically, there was uh, Bitcoin wasn't the first digital cash. Actually, Eric, I'm going to interrupt you one more time. Okay. So I have one, one, one question there. What you described, you said, you know, when Bitcoin goes from Eric to Dan, the whole network knows about it. Can you describe for me, that doesn't sound private. What, how is it, how, where does the privacy come in? Is that because everything is uh, cryptographically encoded? So maybe, you know, they just know that this user sold to that user, but we don't really know their identities. Is that how it works? Yes, somewhat. Um, that's a very common misconception about Bitcoin because the network does use cryptography. There's a presumption of some sort of privacy. And there's not as much privacy as people think there is. By that, I mean, if, if, if my, when I'm sending Bitcoin or when I'm receiving Bitcoin, they're going to my Bitcoin wallet, my digital wallet, which is basically a program that runs on my computer. And the computer doesn't know who I really am. So I have a little bit of anonymity, but the the transactions are 100% public information that anyone who's running this program can watch the transactions. So as far as privacy goes, as, as we've come to understand privacy, meaning I can do something and nobody can find out, Bitcoin doesn't offer that. And, and it was never even part of the idea other than a measure of anonymity that I, I can hold Bitcoin and you may not know who I specifically am unless I start doing transactions with it. And then you can actually track with the software, you can track all of the transactions because that's the value of the Bitcoin network, right? Is, is if you at one time had 100 Bitcoin and you spent 50 of them, the network needs to know about that. So as far as privacy goes, the, the fact that these transactions are all written down onto the ledger means you're giving up some measure of privacy in that once I know your address, I can basically look at your history of it because it is a public ledger. And that's how the ledger is, is secured, is that the same public ledger is shared across every computer on the network. So then there, once this notion of you're not really receiving any kind of privacy, so some measure of anonymity, but not privacy, well, then there were other coins that came out and said, well, we've, we've got to fix that. Uh, so there's other cryptos that were literally designed so that your identity or what you do with them can't be tracked. And those are privacy coins that solve that problem. But Bitcoin really never never was worried about that. It was more worried about tracking that if someone has uh, a certain number of uh, Bitcoin, that we can tell that with 100% certainty that they haven't spent them in two places. Or if they, you know, if, 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 if I'm accepting Bitcoin as a measure of payment from you, I need to know that you really have them and that they're genuine. And Bitcoin said that that was a higher value than your privacy in the transaction. But like I said, there's other coins that have, that have said, well, the privacy is a higher value. Yeah, so Bitcoin then prioritized what you might think of as like the security and reliability. And, you know, they said, well, we're going to be the first one of these. So we better make sure that everyone trusts that a transaction has happened and that it won't be interfered with. Absolutely. Because, and this winds all the way back to the beginning of the conversation, which was because it's peer to peer, 
because there is no central authority, right? Like the old story of um, if you lose your credit card, who takes responsibility for any expenses that are, or anything that's spent on your credit card? Uh, in most cases, the bank takes some responsibility or maybe even the merchant. And that system of credit cards has done everything they can to make the consumer assume the smallest portion of liability. But if there was no bank, there was no central authority watching out for that, then you'd have to have you have to make sure that the system protects the integrity of itself, right? So that that I can't fake how many Bitcoin I have, or I can't spend them twice. So that was the highest, um, the, yeah, the highest goal for it was since there's no central authority to verify that you have what's you know what you claim is in your account, or to transfer me the money when you click send on your uh, on your you know bank account, there's no central authority. So what you tell me has to be accurate when you and I are doing a, a transaction on the Bitcoin network. Okay, now I have a quick question. I have engaged in a grand total of one Bitcoin transactions in my life. And okay. it seemed kind of complicated. Yeah, it seemed, yeah, I'm a, I'm a real expert, right? It seemed kind of complicated. There were a lot of steps to it. And it seems like a that peer-to-peer -peer thing you described would be a lot less complicated and more direct. Was it complicated just because I ultimately wanted to get into US dollars at the end of it? That seemed to be a couple of the steps. That definitely adds a complication to it. And what you've experienced is par for the course for, for uh, cryptos. And I, I think a lot of people, because it's something that was built with uh, completely independently, it, it was difficult for me as well. It was very difficult to get started, difficult to mine. I had a lot of learning to do. And I think the first decade of crypto's development, it is moving in a direction of getting less difficult, less confusing. And I think that 2019, we're about to see, I would call it maybe a watershed event where some of the large financial organizations that we're used to dealing with are making moves to be able to allow you to invest in buy and sell uh, cryptos and convert them into U.S. dollars, et cetera, uh, easy, like we do with a stock. Like uh, when I want to buy Apple stock, I, I log into Fidelity, I click, click, I type in AAPL, and I buy the stock, right? It's easy. And and Fidelity has the money or they, they understand where my dollars are coming from and going to. It's pretty easy. Same with transferring money through banks. And I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely 100% certain that 2019, we're going to see all of the Bitcoin and other currencies that these large institutions, uh, they're getting on board with it. Fidelity already has the capability for institutional investors to buy Bitcoin and hold it through Fidelity. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange is working on a solution for this where they'll have a company called Bact, and Bact, B-A-K-K-T, Bact has raised $182 million from investors who want the convenience of dealing with stocks to apply to cryptos. And there's rumors that Fidelity will allow retail customers within the next couple of weeks. So within the next few days, that rumor may start being less of a rumor and more of news that Fidelity is getting on board. In fact, a lot of people are saying that's probably why Bitcoin is starting to see a bit of a rally. Because, and, and, and I talk about Bitcoin hand in hand with cryptos a lot because right now of the Bitcoin market, of all the cryptos out there, Bitcoin is about 56% of the value of the entire market. So if, if the entire market is worth, let's say, $200 billion of all the cryptos that are out there, Bitcoin is 56% of that. So it's, it's usually the first one to get adopted, it's usually people's first crypto, whether you're an institution or a, or a VC or a private office or something, Bitcoin is usually where people start. And, and as you said, that was the, the first crypto that you did is the first crypto that I did. So we expect to see uh, E-Trade adding Bitcoin soon. 
and Fidelity already has for their institutional clients. So we expect to see them doing that for their retail clients soon. And by soon, I mean, this could be happening over the summer, could be happening in, in the month of May, that what you, your experience of it was difficult uh, could be going away, could be changing drastically. And I think that's going to be what drives the next wave of adoption, that people will start seeing the ability to buy these cryptos in their brokerage account. Okay. So Eric, what do I own when I own Bitcoin? What the heck is it? <laughs> that's a that's another great question. See, I, I love, and that's why I, I like to pin things back to common sense, because the, the common sense questions that you have to ask are the best questions. So what you own is a record of some Bitcoin that were generated. And the, the, the Bitcoin that are out there that we buy and sell from each other are all Bitcoin that are, you, that are paid out as rewards for the computers that are protecting the system. So they're called nodes. And anyone that wants to mine Bitcoin can, can have a computer. It takes a pretty powerful computer now, but they're publicly available. So you could buy this computer and attach it to the Bitcoin network and start mining for more Bitcoin. And what mining is, mining is the process where we're verifying each other's transactions. So if you remember that I had said a peer-to-peer -peer transaction, the, the, you know, I send you a Bitcoin and now you own a Bitcoin. Well, what you're owning is a spot in the memory of this long chain of transactions that says, now Dan has this one Bitcoin. And it's, that's why the, the primary use for this right now is store of value, because what you're storing is the fact that you own one Bitcoin. And as humans, our human nature is to say, well, how much is it worth right? in dollars? And we try to assign a dollar value to it. But uh, what you own is you own a string of digits that says, at this point in time, Eric sent Dan one Bitcoin and it's immutable, right? It will never go away. If later on you choose to spend that, you own the right to spend it as well. So if you think of it as a store of value, almost like a credit in the, the digital ledger of Bitcoin, that's what you own is you own a Bitcoin. And, and the reason I was talking about the mining is because these are powerful computers that suck up a lot of electricity. So there's a reward paid out to the guys, uh, to the organizations, I should say, that are doing the mining. And that reward is more Bitcoin. So you can spend them to pay for your electricity or to pay for your resources. And that's why the Bitcoin market is constantly growing with more Bitcoin, but at a fairly slow rate because there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin generated by its own system as rewards. So we started off with zero Bitcoin and over the course of 10 years, every 10 minutes, new rewards are paid out. And that's the, the Bitcoin that you might want to buy was at some point it was a reward paid to someone for securing the network to each other. Okay. Okay. One question. Now, see, I'm, you just really educated me a lot because I thought that the process of mining was kind of like cryptographically unlocking a Bitcoin, but you're saying, no, it's, you're, you're helping establish the security of the network and you get rewarded for that. Is that an accurate summary? Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. And there is crypto involved in it because think of the fact that uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a tough concept to explain and, a lot, and pretty tough to understand. But if, if I had a computer that the goal of that computer was to protect a ledger, uh, some, say something on, on, on the computer, right? I had a, a very important spreadsheet and I wanted to protect that. But I also wanted to have access to it. So those are the two halves of the scale that are trying to balance against each other, right? If you found out that I had that very important spreadsheet on my computer, you might take a better computer and try to hack my computer. 
right? We're, we're all comfortable with the idea of, of hacking computers. I'm not saying it's a good idea, but if you knew something valuable was located on my computer, you'd try to hack, well, not you, but someone would try to hack it and get that information. So Bitcoin protects itself. This is where the crypto comes in, is it protects itself by saying, in order to get access to this data, you have to solve a problem. And we're going to create a problem that can make itself more difficult the more people that, that, that attempt to solve it. And they try to key the difficulty in so that every 10 minutes, the number of computers that are working on it will come up with a solution. And that's the blocks of time and the blocks of information that Bitcoin uses as its record. So that every 10 minutes, the Bitcoin network updates itself and says, okay, we found another block, let's move on to the next one. So the, the, the unlocking that's going on is all of the computers competing to find a solution to the problem that unlocks that algorithm. And the algorithm can be easy or difficult based on how many people are working on it. So, for example, uh, when I said I started off uh, mining Bitcoin, I, I started off with a laptop a long, long, long time ago. And laptops aren't known to be the most powerful computers, but that was how difficult Bitcoin was at that time. There, was, uh, there wasn't that many people mining it. So my laptop was, was powerful enough that it could solve the problems, the crypto problems, in order to uh, secure the network. And, and I think one thing that I, that I really like about Bitcoin, that, that um, it, it, this, this is what appeals to me, is that every block, every 10 minutes, 12 and a half Bitcoin are rewarded to the network who's trying to secure the network, right? It, you can almost, in common sense terms, you'd think of it like paying a bank security guard in banknotes, right? You, you protect the bank and we'll pay you for that with, with money that the bank is holding. And a lot of people understand that, right? Is if I had a security guard, I'd need to pay him something. So these computers are the bank security guards and they're protecting Bitcoin, but they're being, they're being paid in Bitcoin. So every 10 minutes, 12 and a half Bitcoin are generated. And right now those are worth around $6,000 a piece. So do the math, 12 and a half of those, uh, what's that, $75,000 or so? So if you knew that there was an award, a reward coming in 10 minutes that was worth $75,000, you might point your computer towards that and say, hey, I'd like to solve that. I'd like to solve that puzzle. And as you said, un unlock the, the, the reward, because if I solve the puzzle, I'm the one that receives that 12 and a half Bitcoin reward. And the reward is there to pay people to take the time that, remember you said it was, it was kind of confusing to set up the first transaction of Bitcoin. That's what the reward is for, is to incentivize people to say, well, go, go ahead and do the work to set that computer up and, and allocate your resources to it. Because like uh, Bank of America or New York Stock Exchange, they have computers and they have IT guys, uh, and their, their job is to protect the network. Well, with, with Bitcoin, there is no, uh, <laughs> there's no central authority. There's no IT guys who are protecting the network. It's, it's the users. So there's a reward paid to them in the form of more Bitcoin. And now once I've put that thought out there to you of, wait, if my computer solves the Bitcoin problem to prove out that block and I get paid $75,000, right, that's right. I'm going to point a computer towards it. There's not many other things my computer could do right now that would hand me $75,000 every 10 minutes. Right. So really, it's a competition because enough people have said, I'm going to point my computer toward that and solve that problem, and unlock that block. So now it's a competition. Among all the computers of who do we award this block to? Who do we award this this reward to? Because it's 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 significant. Seventy five thousand dollars every 10 minutes of new Bitcoin wow. being so generated. Eric, we're, we're getting to the end of our time, so I do want to move on and talk about um, 
Eric Wade's Crypto Capital, which is published by Stansbury Pacific Thank Research. You. Yeah. So what do you what do you do in your newsletter? You you recommend cryptos, right? I recommend cryptos, and I look at. Uh, we've actually got a whole team that looks at cryptos that have a very strong use and user base. Like if they're solving a problem that we think a lot of people need that problem solved, and if it's a good, strong team of entrepreneurs that are behind it, and we try to be early into cryptos that have recognized a problem that we're all having that crypto can solve. Like you talked about privacy, or let's say uh, advertising, or any other measure of you know, securing data. You know, is there, a, is there a crypto that's solving these problems? We're constantly scanning all of the cryptos out there. And we believe that because we've been going through a bit of a bubble stage for the last few years with cryptos, we believe that 90% of the cryptos that are out there probably are going to fail. In some respects, it's a lot like, uh, you know, NASDAQ back in the late 90s, early 2000s, right? The dot-com boom. I know people use that analogy a lot, but there's some truth to that because there were a lot of dot-com companies that couldn't withstand the test of time. Or, or what you were talking about before we start talking with, uh, we've got a lot of IPOs that are coming out that don't have any profits behind them. And in some cases, not even enough revenue, 50 times sales. So there's a lot of cryptos that were put into that position where they're not going to withstand the test of time. So what our research does is try to find the ones that are going to and take a small, reasonable, early position in them. And most of our holdings, we end up holding for about six months. We try to find them before the rest of the investors come rushing in and then sell them into strength. Wow, that sounds really cool. We have a special deal for, for listeners um, for your newsletter. Two years of Eric Wade's crypto capital for 2500 bucks, And you can get that if you go to a website called Crypto Flaw Today. Like three words, crypto, C-R-Y-P-T-O, flaw, F-L-A-W, today, T-O-D-A-Y, cryptoflawtoday.com is where you can get that deal. So, Eric, uh, I, I sometimes like to ask my guests, you know, if you could leave our listeners with one thought about your topic, what would it be? And let's make it something that we can all understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I will say that a lot, the, the newsletter and the weekly updates that we send out and then the timely updates are a lot more actionable than the conversation that we just had. Um, most of them are what you can buy on what exchange and exactly how to do that. And we walk you through every step of it. Um, a lot of common sense involved in this. But the one, the one piece that I would say is the most important thing to take away from this is cryptos are still very young. And even though they got a lot of press in the bull run-up of 2017, and then this prolonged bear market of 2018, they're still relatively young. And that's an opportunity for an asset class that's not going away. And institutional investors are coming on fast. Like I said, like the Fidelities and the E-Trades, et cetera. They're, they're, it's going to be easier and easier for more and more people to get involved. So if you ever wanted to participate in an asset class that you somewhat discovered before the majority did, uh, this is your chance. This may be our last chance to get involved with cryptos when it's still somewhat early. And that's what I try to remind my, my readers is that we're trying to get into these early before the general public discovers it, before it becomes the, the retail flavor of the day, um, before they become irrationally overvalued. We, you know, if something like that's going to happen, we want to be the ones that are in it when it happens, not because it happened. Very good. A very good place to leave us. And one more time, people, it's you can get two years of Eric Wade's crypto capital for $2,500. Just go to cryptoflawtoday.com. 
Eric, thank you very much. And we will definitely have you back on at some point to kind of catch us up and, and educate us more about cryptos. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the great questions you asked as well. Thank you. All right, you bet. My pleasure. Okay, folks, time for the mailbag. Remember, your feedback is very important to the success of our show. You can simply email us with a question or a comment at feedback at investorhour.com. I read every single one of them, and I try to respond to as many as possible. And this week, I've got a few good ones here. Uh, let's start out with, um, gosh, this guy, I guess he's anonymous here. I didn't write his name. But he says, hey, Dan, been listening to the show since Porter and Buck started it. Something has irked me for at least a decade. I cannot for the life of me understand why Tesla and especially Elon Musk are held up as such a brilliant investment or Elon such a great businessman. No matter how many times Tesla flounders or Elon makes decisions that should bury the company, the stock rallies and stays way overpriced and overvalued. After so many of your guests pointing out the problems with Tesla, please explain if you can, Dan, why do investors and entrepreneurs continue to hail Tesla and Elon when you would think they should know better? What is the magic that Elon has to fool so many? How can he do no wrong in their eyes? Thanks, Dan. I hope you can help me not hate my short-sighted entrepreneurial friends when they praise Elon and Tesla. Okay, this is a good question. There's a more general case here, right? Look, there, I have no doubt that Elon Musk is a brilliant guy. Um, you know, he, he started PayPal and, and made a ton of money on that. And, uh, you know, he's got these other companies. He, he takes on these big projects and does them. You know, they're blasting rockets off in SpaceX. Um, so you have to give credit where credit is due. He has built a company here. They do make electric cars. And if you've ever driven a Tesla, it is a mind-blowingly awesome experience. I've never driven anything like it. I drove a Tesla Model S last year, and I just came this close to coughing up six figures to buy this car because it blew my mind. And, you know, we're driving along and the, and the, the guy says, um, he was still driving before I took over and he was driving along. He says, well, you know, who's your favorite musician? And I named an obscure guitar player named Alan Holdsworth. And he leaned forward and said, play Alan Holdsworth. And it just started playing Alan Holdsworth. And I thought that was really cool. And the car just went like zero to 60, like a rocket ship, you know, no gears, very few moving parts. So completely unlike um, an internal combustion engine. But, uh, you know, the company is a different story. And it's, it's a different thing altogether to be a credible CEO and, and to represent a, pub, a large publicly traded company. And what happens at times like this is people get really excited about the technology and the story and the guy behind it. And he's a maverick and he smokes pot on the, you know, on the Internet with uh, Joe Rogan. You know, that's very famous. You can just Google that and get pictures of Elon Musk sitting there smoking pot with Joe Rogan. Uh, and and so he's a controversial guy. And people like that. You know, Americans especially like it. It's just it's really culturally we dig it. So there's that, right? And when you lay that over the chance to make a lot of money on a new company, it's, it's easy for me to see how people can get really excited about all this. This is classic investor behavior. Don't take it personally. You know, be, be tolerant with your friends and thank you for the question. Okay, here's another one. It says, will Porter and Buck ever come back? New host is too negative and has been pushing the overvalued market narrative for years. Maybe you will start another podcast? Craig F. I don't usually read these kind of negative ones, but I'm going to read this one because, look, Porter and Buck are not coming back to Stansbury Investor Hour. Porter's off doing his own thing and Buck is off doing his own thing. And I think they're both working on, I know Porter's working on another podcast. So yes, he will be back in some way, shape or form. Uh, as far as me being too negative and pushing the overvalued market narrative for years, I don't think you're talking about me. I have identified successfully several moments throughout the past more than a decade. I've said, 
you know, in, in early 2008, I said, this is going to get a lot worse. Hold on to your hats. And it got a lot worse. Hold on to your hats. And, you know, I was reckon I was pounding the table on Walmart and it was up 21% that year, including dividends. And I recommended uh, W.R. Bar Barkley and, and he also was showed a positive return that year. So, you know, you can tell me I'm the negative guy all you want to, but you're way overstating and you're not paying attention. And, and in 2015, I refused to recommend stocks, which everybody hated. And it turned into the worst year since 2008 until last year. And, you know, last year, October 1, I stood in front of hundreds of people at the Stansbury event in Vegas and said, first time in my career, October 1st, 2018, you, it might be a good time to buy some put options. And guess what? It was a freaking phenomenal time to buy some put options. So I'm, I'm identifying risk. I'm not being too negative. And I've been consistently negative or consistently concerned about overvaluation in the stock market since May of 2017. Okay, that's two years. So technically speaking, you're right, years. But the overvalued market narrative, uh, it really does me great injustice. I've come up with several long ideas. We picked Starbucks last August. The thing is up 50%. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I'll move on. Eric H. writes in and says, in episode 99, you mentioned a number of different valuation metrics that indicate the market is at all-time highs and therefore subject to a crash were very marginal returns for a long time. But what none of those metrics seem to take into account is interest rates. If a stock price is in essence the present value of all future earnings, it makes sense that all-time low interest rates would result in all-time high stock prices. If rates stay where they are or fall over the next 20 years, then current valuations don't seem unreasonable. What role should interest rates play when valuing the stock market? Love the show. Keep up the good work. Eric H. Thank you, Eric. What role should interest rates play when valuing the stock market? Um, well, that's important. You have to choose, when, when you're doing the calculation that you refer to, the present value calculation, you have to choose some, some rate, some interest rate or, or hurdle rate of some kind. And what better rate than current interest rates? The problem is, when you, the lower and lower the interest rate you use, the higher and higher the value. Other things being equal, how can it be that the, that the uh, intrinsic value of a business goes way the heck up just because interest rates are lower? There, to me, there's a disconnect there. And look, Warren Buffett has said the same thing you did. He said, you know, if interest rates stay like this for the next 30 years, I think he said, then stocks are cheap today. Not realize, when I hear that, I think that's a big if. If interest rates if interest rates stay at their all-time lowest ever for decades, I, I just think that's a bad assumption. That's really, that's my point. I, I think it's a bad assumption to, to think that rates will stay low and prices will stay exorbitantly high indefinitely. That's, that's all. That's all I'm saying. Okay, let's move on. Um, let's see here. Dear Dan, this is Terry I. Terry I says, Dear Dan, after listening to your last few episodes, which I truly enjoyed, I get the feeling I should short the market and invest in metal, metals and royalty mining companies like Aldeus Minerals and maybe raise some cash due to high valuations in the market. Am I taking this right? I realize you cannot give financial advice. Also, did you not advise using fin Yahoo Finance for information? Can you advise, advise a better source of gathering information on stocks in the market? Thanks, Terry I. So last question first. The best source of information is the original SEC filings, period. You just can't get a better source than that. The other question is, yes, you took it wrong. Uh, I, I absolutely do not want people to go all in cash, short the market, and just buy metals and royalty mining companies. This month in Extreme Value, we're going to put out another issue in a couple of days here, um, actually tomorrow. And, and it's going to tell you the name of a stock that we think is undervalued that's not anywhere near the, the mining industry or metals. You know, it's just a good business. And when you find them and they're priced right, you should buy them. You, you, it's very difficult to say, okay, I'm going to stop buying stocks. I'm going to go into cash. You know, you can be wrong for years and years and years at a time and miss out on all that return. 
my point in identifying these things is that, like I've said, there's, there's, it's very rare that you should think about this stuff, but you should think about the valuation of the overall market when it's either very, very high, near all-time highs, or near all-time lows. And we're near all-time highs, so you got to keep it in mind. You got to ask yourself, should I really be paying 50 times sales for the Beyond Meat IPO? Eh, maybe not, right? That, that's the kind of thinking. You start with that and then you go back down and say, you know, should I be paying, you know, 40 or 50 times earnings, even though so, such and such may be a really great business? And as I pointed out, like really great businesses can treat you horribly, as horribly as as not so great businesses. Great businesses won't save you when the stock market crashes, in other words. But that doesn't mean you should sell out your entire portfolio. If you're a rational, long-term investor and you found some really great companies, you don't want to sell them out just because we're in a bear market. You may even want to buy more, okay? Having said that, what most investors do is the exact wrong thing. They panic at the bottom and sell out for a huge loss. And that's why I've started talking about using trailing stops because I realize um, most people are going to do the wrong thing. And most people are just, they, they just can't grasp the discipline of buying low and selling high. They want to wait until it's high and buy and pray for higher. And that's not how it works. So this is a good question. I'm glad you asked it. No, I do not intend to tell everyone to sell everything and short the market. Um, although recently, and really even right now, put options on the overall market in various for, through various underlying instruments um, are kind of cheap. I can't talk about it because I'm contractually forbidden to talk about things I actually own. So I can't identify them specifically, but you know, it's, it's not a bad time to kind of hedge your bets a little bit, especially like in, U, in the U.S. stock market. Great question. Thank you very much. That's it. That's it for the 101st episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Uh, listen, thanks so much for, for being here for 101 episodes. Be sure to check out our recently revamped website. You can listen to all the episodes there, get all the latest updates. Just go to that same address, www.investorhour.com. That's it for this week. I will talk to you next week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email at feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is provided for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.